back in the 1950s, uh, President Eisenhower was concerned about uh, what he called the campaign of hatred against us in the Arab world, uh, not among the governments who are more or less okay, but among the people. Uh, and uh, this is secret then, it's been declassified since. Uh, the National Security Council, major planning agency, uh, issued a, a memorandum on this issue. It uh, uh, stated that uh, there's a perception in the Arab world that the United States supports a di harsh and brutal dictatorships and that the U.S. blocks democracy and development, and we do it because we want to control their resources. And it went on to say that the perception is more or less accurate, and furthermore, that's what we ought to be doing. Uh, and as, as long as the population's quiet, it doesn't matter. The dictators support us, so everything's fine. Uh, that's 1958. Uh, 2001, Defense Science Board essentially came up with the same conclusion. Uh, the same conclusion holds this today. It was strikingly illustrated in the WikiLeaks revelations. Uh, and one of the, the ones that got the most publicity, you know, big headlines, uh, euphoric commentary, were the uh, revelations in cables that uh, uh, the Arabs support U.S. policy towards Iran. That's really important. Uh, one slight flaw in those reports. They were referring to the Arab dictators. They allegedly support our policies towards Iran. What about the Arab population? Well, we know their feelings. There are major polls taken by the U.S., uh, the leading U.S. polling agencies, uh, released by prestigious institutions, booking institutions, uh, not reported in the United States, incidentally. As far as I know, one report in England, Jonathan Steele had an article in The Guardian about it. I think that's the only one. Uh, they're interesting. They say that uh, there are indeed Arabs who support U.S. policies on Iran. About 10 percent think that Iran is a threat. Um, overwhelmingly, they regard uh, the United States and Israel as the major threats. In Egypt, 90% uh, regard the United States as the major threat. In fact, opposition to U.S. policies is so strong uh, that a majority favor, uh, say, the region would be better off if Iran had nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, almost 80% in Egypt, uh, high percentage in the rest of the region. Well, that won't do, again, for the usual reasons. Uh, it's this, uh, so therefore, this is totally, almost totally suppressed, as far as I know. Uh, Steele is the only re report in the English-speaking world outside of critical, you know, I write about it, other people in the margins write about it, but uh, the, uh, uh, what the reactions reveal, once again, the uh, simply extreme contempt for democracy. As long as the dictators back us, it really doesn't matter what the population thinks. If there's a campaign of hatred against us among the population and the dictators are in control, everything's fine. Uh, euphoric headlines. Uh, that was 1958, uh, 2001, today. It's, it's uh, standard. In the case of Britain, it goes back much earlier. It goes back uh, you know, a century and a half, two centuries. Uh, the U.S., it's standard since the U.S. replaced Britain as global hegemon. And France is the same, if not worse. Uh, in fact, every great power acts pretty much the same way. Uh, well, you know, these are things in the background of uh, terrorism. You have to pay attention to them. We also know pretty well how to deal with terrorism. In fact, Britain uh, led the way in this case. Uh, in, in Northern Ireland, uh, terrorism was pretty serious. The IRA terror, uh, British terror was even worse, of course, but that's the usual balance of forces. Uh, but IRA terror was not a joke. Uh, as long as Britain reacted to it with greater terror, uh, the cycle of terrorism increased. And finally, uh, last in the 90s, uh, uh, Britain finally responded uh, with U.S. pressure in this case uh, in a sensible way. Uh, they uh, tried to pay attention to the grievances that lay behind the terror. There were grievances, real ones. Uh, so Britain started to pay attention to the grievances. Uh, uh, terror reduced. Uh, 
uh, people who had been involved, you know, IRA hitmen were brought into uh, the negotiations. Uh, some of them now ended up in the government. It's not utopia, but it's a big difference from what it was before. I, I was actually in Belfast in 1993, and it was like a war zone. I was back last year, and it's peaceful, you know. There's tensions, but the kind of tensions that exist in every city. I mean, I, I couldn't see them, but people told me, you know, this is a Protestant neighborhood, and if you're Catholic, you don't go into it, and that sort of thing. But uh, uh, but it certainly wasn't what it was in 1993. Okay, and that's the way to deal with terror. Uh, take a look at its causes and its sources, if you want to reduce it. But uh, uh, states uh, do not consider uh, 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 terror a major problem. It's, it's true of Britain and the United States, for example. This came out in the Chilcot hearings, clearly. The head of British intelligence testified that when the U.S. and Britain invaded Iraq, uh, they both anticipated that it would increase terror. Actually, it did a lot more than anyone expected. It increased it by about a factor of seven. But they both anticipated it was going to increase terror, but they're other purposes. Uh, there are higher priorities than uh, 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 protecting the domestic populations. So they went to war. And that's not unusual. Could, there were time to go over many more examples. Uh, anyhow, I think these are some of the things that should be kept in mind in thinking about the return to barbarism in our time, you know, the plague of terrorism in our age, and so on.